Hi, y'all. This is Kristen Chenoweth. Hi, I'm Gloria Stefan. This is Sarah Bareilles. Hi, I'm Patty Lapone. This is Lynn Manuel Miranda. You're listening to the Broadway Podcast Network. Welcome back to the Theater Podcast, intimate personal conversations with the industry's biggest names. I'm your host, Alan Seals, and this episode is with SpongeBob himself, Ethan Slater. He loves to write as much as he loves to perform. That actually surprised me how he went into that as kind of needing to be both on stage and behind the curtain to keep himself whole. Admittedly, he caught some amazing breaks auditioning for and then starting to work on SpongeBob while still in college. I didn't realize he was that young when he started, but it was a seven-year road to get the show onto Broadway. And then, as we all know, this led to his Tony nomination for his Broadway debut, which is extremely rare. When the pandemic hit, he actually took some time off of performing. We haven't seen him online much lately, but now he's coming back. He focused on his own mental health. He's doing a whole lot more now, including the upcoming concert on May 24th for the Town Hall Signature Series, Broadway by the Year. He's going to be performing virtually with a bunch of other big names. And of course, we talk about that. But find me online on Instagram and Twitter at theater underscore podcast or on facebook.com slash official theater podcast. Leave a rating, leave a review, wherever you are listening now. Everybody, please enjoy this episode now with Ethan Slater. Here you go. One, two, three. Today's guest made his Broadway debut in the title role of SpongeBob SquarePants, the musical, which earned him a Tony nomination and a Drama Desk Award win. He is a star of stage and screen with TV credits that include Instinct, Law and & Order, and Fosse Verdon. He's now part of a <laughs> phenomenal lineup of people performing in the Town Hall Signature Series, Broadway by the Year, as part of the May 24th concert, all about the Andrew Lloyd Webber years. Ethan Slater, welcome to the Theater Podcast. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am excited to talk about about this uh, Town Hall Signature Series, like Broadway by the Year. It's it's interesting to me that they, how they group it up. So April 26th is the Cole Porter years. May mm -hmm. 10th is the second concert, the Candor and Ebb years. May 24th is the Andrew Lloyd Webber years. So talk me through actually how you got involved with this, because I want to know if, like, did you get to pick which years you get to sing about? Or were they just like, here's what, you, here's what you're going to do? I mean, I did, I, uh, fortunately I did get to pick, although, um, you know, what an amazing group to pick from. You sort of can't go wrong, but I got an email from Scott Siegel, who's, uh, I had done one of the town hall concerts before and, and, um, you know, he generously reached out to reinvite me to be a part of it again and said, we have these three things coming up. It's super exciting. Um, you know, what calls out to you and to be honest, um, there are reasons why I could have justified e any of those three calling out to me. But whenever anyone asks me what my favorite musical is, my answer is always Jesus Christ Superstar. Um, just because I can't, it's just like, you know, been the thing, my go-to, that movie. It's just like my go-to. I don't know why. I just love it. And so um, that was why I was like, well, you know, maybe the Andrew Lloyd Webber one. Uh, or as, as you said earlier, all about Webber, which... Uh, <laughs> did, sort of, did, I, did I say all, did, about Weber? Did all about Weber? It sort of somehow seems like uh, the perfect acronym. Um, and so, yeah, so then we were like, well, what's, what songs would work? And we started the conversation there sort of on the, on the creative side of it. And uh, I'm really excited about it. I mean, we were just talking about the, the cast list of each of these nights and it's just right. stacked on stacked. Right. Well, you're, you're alongside... Max von Essen and Liz Calloway, Ali Ewald, and like the slew of other people. Do do you uh, like it's Andrew, the Andrew Lloyd Webber years? All about Webber. Mm -hmm. um, were, <laughs> did you decide which song you're going to sing, or are you just are you are you like I'm going to do Jesus Christ Superstar? Or did they give you a whole list of things? Like I want to know what to expect because I I want to be I want to be adequately prepared. Totally, that's so smart of you because you you don't want to be surprised by that because it's going to be. It's going to be overwhelming <laughs> to begin with. No, the, uh, I, you know, of course, I'm not actually doing a Jesus Christ Superstar song. I, I had, I was like, hey, here's like five songs that I think would be super fun. And we talked about why each one, and we ended up going with two. I'm singing a song from Sunset Boulevard, and I'm singing a song from Joseph, um, which is another one of those, you know, growing up, going to Jewish day school. Um, I watched Joseph in like early classes all the time just to be like, see, like the Bible makes it into pop culture. Um, and, 
you know, just, we didn't watch Jesus Christ Superstar for that version of it, but we did watch Joseph. Um, so that's going to be super fun. And I get to like play both sides of me um, in these two songs that I'm doing, which is going to be super fun. That That's a lot of fun. And I mean, for me, uh, I guess like what, I know you most from, and what I think a lot of people probably know you from is SpongeBob, of course. And that's that was very goofy. And I imagine you just walking around like with your with your hands doing the flipper thing <laughs> that that SpongeBob does, right? But obviously, that is that is a comedic role. Is that more of what you are ha, have been drawn to, or like is this? Do you use this sort of thing along with any other performance uh, opportunity to showcase different sides, or is there like? I guess I, my question is, do you have a lane that you like to stick in or is it just, I want to perform? Yeah, I, it's it's such a good question because I think that there's um, there's so many ways to go about a, a career as an actor or as a performer, which is, you know, you find the thing that you really love to do and you sort of like go, um, you know, like whole hog into it. Um, and and I, I, I love that, but I also do feel like I, there's, there's so many versions of acting that I want to be doing. There's so many versions of storytelling that I want to be doing. Um, I probably one of the biggest parts and passions of my career is writing. And so I, you know, that's a whole other angle of storytelling. Um, I, when I was in college, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to start working on SpongeBob when I was in college, but you know, at the time I didn't think that I was a going to ever be doing musical theater or B that I was going to be, um, doing comedy quite in this way. I always loved physical comedy. It was my favorite thing to watch. It was my favorite thing to sort of like pretend to do, to like emulate and like just like do in the living room. Um, but I never thought I was quite good enough at it. You know, everybody that I was watching was so much better than I ever thought I could be. Um, so to be able to have my first thing be a, a big physical comedy musical was like, that was a huge surprise. Um, so yeah, I, I would say that I think that I, I'm I'm not trying to stay in that as my lane. I really love the idea of having broad character experiences, broad broad opportunities um, to dive into different genres and different you know psyches. When you say writing, do you mean? I originally thought you meant just songwriting, but it sounded it sounds like you mean like full full book lyrics writing, or is it like just outside of songs completely? Yeah, um, I do I do songwriting, um, and I love that. Uh, and I do a lot of sort of screenwriting and, and playwriting. Um, so I do, you know, I'm, there's musicals that I've been working on where I'm doing in various iterations, book, music, lyrics. Um, but then I also do uh, things that are totally, that where the music is just part of the landscape. It's not a musical. So it's sort of all over the place. Well, when, what do you really see yourself doing? I mean, you're still, I think you just turned 30. If I, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. I got, or whatever. I got a couple years. I got a couple years till then. But yeah, so cool. you're still, so you're still young, right? Like in the grand, <laughs> in this grand scheme of Broadway career, careers in life, you're still very young. Um, I'm 40, so you know, if you're, if you haven't been 30 yet, you haven't even, you haven't even started living yet. You're still young too. Look at that. <laughs> I, I feel that way. Uh, but while at the same time, I look at other forty-year-olds, and I'm like, "Well, damn it, they did way more than I have at this point. I got, <laughs> I got to kick the game up." Um, but for, you know, for me, I, I, I look back at at someone like you, late twenties now, who you just said you were working at SpongeBob in college, come out of college, and then all of a sudden, the show you've been working on makes it to Broadway. Luck number one. Then you get a freaking Tony nom for this performance. Luck number two, and. I feel like me, knowing who I was in my late 20s, I would have been like, well, I got it made. The rest of this mm -hmm. career is just going to fall in place for me. Tony Nam means automatic awesome. And then, obviously, that's not how it is. Add on top of a global pandemic, everything that's going on with that and the industry being shut down. And, and I guess what i'm trying to say is mm -hmm. hey, two parts one how are you handling all this like what have you been doing to maintain your sanity and two did you did you have sort of a did you have to adjust your expectations after spongebob made it to broadway then got the tony nom yeah those are i mean those are just there are so many good parts of that question in there i mean yes on one on one side of things, I was like, whoa, it's all going up. It's like never going to change. It's always going to be this. Um, 
But I think I'd also, you know, I was lucky enough to start working on SpongeBob when I was in college, but we never knew that it was going to happen. And it was years of development. It was like, I worked on it for seven years. So it was years of development where I, it was just ups and downs the whole way through. And so I got it. So I got a taste of how you can think that you're, you got it made. And then three years later, you're still not on Broadway. Um, and of <laughs> course, like, I, no bones about it. I might, like I, I have had some really huge breaks and like really unbelievably lucky breaks. The only reason that I was seen for SpongeBob was because I had applied to a summer apprenticeship program to be like an intern basically. Um, and I had to audition for that. They liked my audition, called me in for a Shakespeare show. Um, one of the most amazing casting directors ever, um, Erica Jensen and, and, uh, you know, over at Clary Casting saw me and said to her colleague, Paul, like, hey, he auditioned for um, this Shakespeare show. He's the right shape. You know, like, you should see if he <laughs> wants to do SpongeBob. Um, and so they called me into audition for that. So like, you know, like all of these things lined up in a way that I couldn't have made happen if I tried. And so I'm like, I, I'm aware on the one end of the super luck of it. And on the other end of like how it almost didn't happen. Um, and then, yeah, like, you know, after SpongeBob closed, I was doing a, I did a, a sort of a string of TV things. I had some writing stuff that was really taking off and it was like going sort of well, but like slowly and like it was hard and it wasn't quite the same like level and pace that SpongeBob had been. And then I was incredibly excited because I had booked um, this like film that I was going to do. And then I was going to do assassins, a classic stage. And I was going to show like, Hey, I'm not just bright eyed SpongeBob, but I can also, you know, play Lee Harvey Oswald and play guitar on stage while I'm doing this stuff. And like surrounded by, um, just like the most outrageous cast that is the most intimidating thing ever. Um, and of course pandemic shut it down and I had to sort of go through that again, go through that like sort of loss of opportunity, um, although I, I should say that I think that the the biggest loss there was not the opportunity of the career moving, but rather just the opportunity to keep working on it. Because you know, the from the first two weeks that we were working on uh, that show in rehearsal were just like, you know, I don't know, kid in a candy shop I was just like soaking it all in. I was there all day, and then I was going home, and I was practicing at night because I was like so overwhelmed by trying to play Sondheim music in a John Doyle production on guitar. You know. <laughs> <It's> like, um, <laughs> Anyway, the, the long-winded thing of that is that, like, yeah, it's it's been a total roller coaster, and I think the way that I have been able to deal with it in the best way possible is that when I am not working as an actor, even if I'm just sitting at my computer writing, I'm not a, a an actor who's writing. I'm I'm a writer who acts, um, and then when I'm acting, I'm an actor who writes. And I think that like sort of that framing for me has been really good in terms of my, in terms of my own mental health, mental health about being like, I, I'm not wasting time or I'm not losing time. Um, I'm doing the thing that I love and that I'm passionate about. Um, and it's just about, you know, there are different moments when each one um, takes the forefront or takes the stage. Well, do you have, do you have a, a preference if you had to pick one Right now, obviously, well, okay, not right now, because there's <laughs> very little theater happening right now. But assuming no pandemic, everything's fine, life is good, would would you, uh, Assassins, um, you would have done Assassins, right? And who knows what would have come out of that, but, or what would have come out of that. But do you, do you, at the end of the day, do you enjoy the feeling of the exhaustion of the eight show week? Or do you enjoy the feeling of of seeing your original work being performed on stage by other people? Mm. Like what, what, what really makes you feel whole inside? God, such a good question. I think, I think what I feel, the thing that makes me feel most lucky is that both are incredibly rewarding to me. I think as long as I'm exhausted <laughs> and, <laughs> and overworked, then I feel really fulfilled by it. Um, yeah, I mean... It's just it's just a, a really different feeling, but they're both really, I think, critical to for for myself to feel sort of whole is to have both of those things. I, I will say, like for me, the best part of any process is rehearsal. And I was super, super worried about doing a year-long run in SpongeBob. I was terrified because I had only done a couple of long runs. And and when I say long, I mean like two to three months. Like nothing 
that had been anything like this. And by the end of two to three months, in all of those runs, even when I loved the shows, even when I loved what I was doing, I felt tired and I felt like I was repeating something um, and it didn't feel inventive anymore. And I love rehearsal because I love inventing things. I love like coming up with ideas and throwing them out and coming up with new ones. Um, and so I was really terrified about that. But I was relieved beyond all relief to find that I, I loved every single performance of SpongeBob, even when I was exhausted and, and um, you know, having trouble with high notes or having trouble doing the splits. I was still having so much <laughs> fun and finding new ways to reinvent in, within the same sort of structured show. So I guess my answer to you is that I have, um, I have no good answer. I, I, can't, I think <laughs> um, I, I really, I actually just got back from filming a short film that I wrote with my good friend and we were in it and we'd written it. Um, and I don't think that I want to be in everything I write because there's something unbelievably beautiful about watching somebody else and having the collaboration between writer and actor and being, you know, that collaboration yeah. is like so beautiful. But in terms of the exhaustion piece, um, doing way too many things and just throwing yourself, you know, 20 hours a day into a, a project just feels great. It was, it, it's interesting to me that you said that uh, about um, you know having the collaboration and whatnot, and and I just heard actually as we record this, I just recorded with Rick Pender, who mm. released um, the 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 Sondheim, the Stephen Sondheim Encyclopedia. It's like six hundred pages of everything Sondheim. And one of the things we talked about that that fascinated me about Sondheim is when he wrote Sweeney Todd, how Prince was like, no. What you told me it's about, it, that's not what it's about. So I'm going to make it about this other thing that it ended up turning into, right? And so Sondheim, being the genius that he is, was like, oh, okay, well, you interpreted it differently. I'm going to let you as the director go off and do your thing. So it, who knows that if, it, if Sondheim had been charged with directing it, would it have ever been a hit? Because Hal Prince turned it into something that the writer originally never intended. So... I I enjoy too that um, that you're very much open to the collaboration too, and especially in the rehearsal process. You mentioned um, discovering and discovering new beats. There are things that as a, that your actors, as you're writing, are going to find for you that you never intended to be in the script. It's it's the stuff between the lines that's really important, right? Totally, I, and you know, it's sort of that thing that you learn in English class, right? That that um, you can analyze in, in like high school English class, you can analyze literature past the point of the author's intent and you can still glean some absolutely beautiful meaning from it. Even if, you know, one kid in the class goes, there's no way that, you know, F. Scott Fitzgerald meant that, you know, um, it's still, it still is that valuable. And I think that that's what's so fun about the collaborative part of theater. It's just like so much literary criticism coming at you from all angles. Does that affect you, like the negative criticism, or do you care? Do you care about positive or negative, or are you just like writing for you? Oh wow, yeah. I mean, like the the ideal answer is like, no, no, no. I write for me, but that's that's ridiculous. <laughs> um, like, I, I write for my collaborators. I think I think that really affects me. The people who I'm working with on something. It's not that I want them to like what I do. It's that if we're putting something together, we have to all like it. You know, like it has to be. Um, it has. If if I'm bringing something to a collaboration and they're bringing something to that collaboration, we have to meet in the middle and we have to find the beauty in both ideas, even if they're in opposition at first. So I think that that kind of criticism like feels really good. I mean, but then of course the other thing that you're hinting at is like um, the criticism that we face a lot of in SpongeBob, which is like, oh, look at this cash grab, like look at this this <laughs> end of Broadway. This is the worst thing that's ever happened. The number of blog posts that before we came out, you know, a year before we came out, were like, this is the end of Broadway. Um, I think one of the the things that was a huge huge relief, just to be totally honest, because I I felt so confident before anybody had seen it, and we were getting all of that, you know, smack talk. I was like just wait till they see it. Like, th this is not, it could be exactly what they're saying. And I understand why they're making this huge assumption, but they don't understand who Tina Landau is. They don't understand um, the trust that Nickelodeon was putting in Tina Landau. So I, I felt like deep in my heart, like, here's, here's the thing, like, we're going to show all the haters and it's going to be 
um, glorious. And then the, the, the relatively good news is that that's sort of what happened. You know, we got a fair number of reviews that were like, I really didn't want to like it. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was okay. It was good. You know, and, and so, um, begrudgingly like, yeah, all right. Yeah. Like here's, here's all the things that I like sort of liked about it, you know, just like, like, um, frustratingly go, you know, and, and so that, that was like a really, a nice, a really nice thing. But if it had gone fully the other way and everyone had, and everyone had said we were right, this was, you know, that, that would have been hard to read. Um, and so I really tried to not read any reviews because I, I just could sense that it would go that way and it would like, I don't know, change my performance or change how I felt about it. And um, I didn't want that to happen. So I wasn't going to read any reviews. And I think I knew at the time that that was a fool's errand because you go to the opening night party and everybody's walking up to you. And I know that you can't see my face right now, but they're just walking up with just like the widest eyes. Like, did you read it yet? Did you see it yet? You know, and like, there's just, it's just impossible to avoid. Um, but like deep in my heart of hearts, I want to be the person who does successfully avoid it. I don't know if I am, but I want to be that person. Well, that's, that's for, I mean, actually I wasn't hinting at SpongeBob, but I'm glad you brought oh, that up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I meant, I meant like when you're, when you're writing, um, when you're actually writing, not, not yeah, acting, yeah, yeah. Right? Um, but yeah, I, cause it's, it's, Interesting. Again, speaking for myself, I feel like when I was on stage, I used to perform. It, I wanted, I wanted to say exactly what you were saying. I want to not care for people who don't care, because not everyone's going to like you. I don't want to mm -hmm. care about the haters, but I want enough people to like me so that someone says, "Yeah, that's pretty good," right? I don't totally. like. I, I'm. I didn't have any delusions of being Meryl. You know, no one, no one can be that good except for Meryl. But uh, I wanted to at least have some sort of positive, like, yeah, yeah, you know, he's helping amplify the show and bring it up instead of the other way around. Well, it's just so hard. I mean, to go to the writing part of it as well and, and the acting part, it's so hard to keep moving forward if you're not getting any positive reinforcement. I mean, maybe that's just, maybe that's just the uh, attention seeker in me. You know, that's like the my kid at heart, who my, who my, who I was as a child, like that I've never really let go of, but like, it's really hard to keep at something when all you're receiving is negative feedback. Um, and you know, I, I have been in the position of like, really want, like, I, I wrote something that I won't get too, too specific about it, but I felt incredibly good about this idea. I thought it was like the best idea I'd ever come up with. People were telling me that it had this happy Gilmore vibe, like this sort of like really like sort of broad comedy, really um, wacky stuff, right? And I was like, you know, I was like, no, I was going for like a more Martin McDonough kind of thing, you know. Um, and I just felt really good about this being like a, a a a film about philosophical questions and like you know with some like really great action and, and dynamic storytelling, but that's what it was. Um, and nobody saw it but me and. <laughs> and it, I like really wanted to be the person who was like, I'm just going to keep at it and I'm going to write this thing and it is going to crush. Um, and uh, it, it's just, you know, it's been on the back burner ever since. Um, which is, which is just all to say like, th that's the kind of thing that does happen a lot. That's just one example. Cause it was just such a funny thing of me really not getting across what I wanted to get across. But I am sort of a firm believer even if I don't want to be in theory, I think in practice, I am a firm believer that like, if it, to only speak about myself, like if I'm trying to get something across and I'm not getting it across, odds are it's not the audience's fault. You know, like if in the same way that literary criticism leaves the author's intent is sort of um, secondary, is interesting if you're studying it, but otherwise is not really what it is. Like, if, if I'm not getting across what I want to be getting across, I'm not telling the story I want to be telling. And um, so I need to keep at it and, and, you know, think about why. So, which is to say that I think that criticism is sometimes hard and hurtful, but it's always, always helpful. It's 100% it's always helpful. Well, do you tend to take it personally? Or because I guess... There's criticism that you can get, and you're like, oh, yeah, cool, cool. All right, so I can, I understand that not everyone likes it. This is actually helpful. But 
is there a point when it first comes in and you're and you just think, I why am I doing this? This is just this is so this is such bad criticism. I'm never going to get it right because <laughs> I have those moments where I put something out sometimes and I'm like, oh damn it, that was really bad. I should <laughs> quit. And then after time goes on, I have to remind myself that there's another that there's there's the other side of it, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, like and and that's come with training of being as old as I am now. We talked about age a little while ago. Like as old as I am, I've, I've got that. But like I said, in my 20s, I would have been all over the place and like an emotional mess. Yeah, I mean, it's a conversation that I actually have with my friends and collaborators all the time. Like I talk about, you know, whether we're getting notes from each other or we're getting notes from friends or we put something into the world and we're getting feedback from, you know, the internet. Um, I, I, I have this conversation a lot with friends And it's a really supportive thing. It's just like, how do you deal with hearing a note that you immediately are like, oh, that's terrible. That's just not, I hate that. Um, And how do you deal with like hearing it and just being like, okay, let give myself time to process it. Um, And I think that I've gotten a lot better at that over the years. I, I think that there's always, there's always more ways to go, but you know, processing and giving yourself time to process emotional reactions to things is sometimes a privilege that not that you don't always have, but is a really um, wonderful tool if you can give yourself that time in that space. We're going to take a short break. Stay tuned for more of the episode. Well, back me up then to uh, your childhood. I want to figure out how you became this well-rounded <laughs> individual that you are now. So tell me, you, you were born in D.C., I believe, right? Yeah, yeah, I was. You no, know, Washington, D.C., which actually is, uh, I think, the first person you've, you're the first person I've interviewed that's come from D.C. So All far. right. So, yeah, not a lot of come from D.C. A lot from Washington State, strangely. But there's a, there's anyway. a big, like, Spokane, Washington contingency. And yeah, yeah, there's a lot from like the North Carolina, the Raleigh area, a lot from Spoke. Yeah, no, but DC, not so many. But what got you into into performing? Well, I feel like it was a slow on ramp. You know, I was sort of like a performative child. I was like doing you know videos with my older sisters in the basement. We were like performing Grease. Um, my oldest sister was playing Dorothy in a community theater production of The Wizard of Oz. You know, like the neighborhood got together and did these performances at the at um, you know the Children's Hospital in DC. And I, she needed a Toto, and she was like, "Could my little brother play Toto?" And I was four, and I that was my. Uh, you know, my auspicious debut. Um, I, you know, had like a, you know, I was barking and I was running, I was running around on the ground at her side. Um, and my little anecdote about that production is that I had like one thing I had to do, which is I had to spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't seen the wizard of Oz. (laughs) I'll give you a second to pause or mute. Um, uh, I had to reveal the wizard at the end, just like grab the curtain with my teeth, reveal the wizard. And I grabbed it with my teeth. I tripped and pulled down the whole apparatus on top of the <laughs> um, single adult in the show. And we were like, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. <laughs> so that's how it all started. Um, it's going, it's going, it's going pretty well since then. It's going good. And I was like, man, <laughs> I have got it. <laughs> um <laughs> And then I was just doing like little school plays and, and things. And I really loved it. I just, I loved it. Um, and in high school I was doing, you know, I, I auditioned for the play my freshman year and didn't get in. Um, and so I was doing, you know, I played sports uh, and I was like really into wrestling and I did a little bit of baseball. And then my sophomore year I auditioned for the play and I did get in. I got like I, I was a part of this awesome, awesome ensemble of of students, and I got to, um, you know, I had a couple of lines that I had to do in a, a Yorkshire accent. Um, so I had like, you know, it was it was just a great experience. And then I started like doing a little bit more and more, and um, got a role in the musical. And then the next year, I got a role in the play again. And then I started, you know, I uh, the big moment for me in terms of, of being like, oh, I really like this and I think I could devote myself to becoming good enough to do it professionally, was that my junior year, 
we were doing the producers and um, I was playing Bloom and my dear friend Noah Robbins was playing Max Bialystok and Noah had been going back and forth for these auditions for a show in New York from DC. And I already knew that Noah was the best actor I'd ever met. He was just like so good as a high schooler. Um, and he was like going back and forth. And the day of our final dress rehearsal for the producers, he was on his way back from New York. And he called me to say like, don't tell anyone yet. But I got the part. And he was playing Eugene in Brighton, Be- Brighton Beach Memoirs on Broadway. Wow. Um, and so, of course, I was like, you guys, he did it. And we all met him at the front of the school when he got there. And we like carried him, you know, proverbially carried him all the way to the theater. Um, <laughs> but it was just like this huge moment of like seeing success up close that, again, like I'm I'm super aware was a, was a huge privilege. And I was like, wow, this is OK. If Noah can do it, um, I, I still probably can't, but I can try. And the, just one other thing that Noah has taught me so much, and he says that he he doesn't remember saying this, but it 100% was him. I can see it time and place. I remember it very distinctly. I said to him, like, why are you so good at acting? Like, what makes you good? Can you just give me advice? And his response was like, I don't know. I feel like, <laughs> um, I feel like the key to good acting is to make everyone else on stage look better than you. Um, and like, I don't know how I took it at the time, but over the years, what that's meant to me is that Acting is all about throwing your focus and throwing your intention at the other people around you and telling a collaborative story that acting isn't about yourself uh, in any moment, even when you're alone on stage. It's about the collective. Um, So I'm eternally grateful to Noah for that. Oh, that's that's amazing. Yeah, it's, I mean, acting, they say, they, the proverbial they, they say it. Be a good actor, you have to be a good listener. You authentically, of course, react in the moment and all of that stuff. So I that's what that was my interpretation of what you say he said that he doesn't remember. Oh, that's it, that's so right. That that feels spot on. Yeah, because you're you're throwing it to somebody else, you're listening and you're reacting and you're being there for them. And when both are when both people on stage are doing that, or everybody on stage is doing that, then the rising tide lifts all ships and the whole performance just comes across as that much better, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, how are you? How are you maintaining then your own sanity in in here early twenty twenty one? Obviously, like I see on in, online, you've been posting some uh, performance videos, but um, and you're doing this concert, of course, coming up on May twenty fourth. But otherwise, you know. I know so many actors, Broadway actors, Tony-nominated Broadway actors who have gone home to live with their parents completely outside of the city. And they just don't, they haven't decided if they want to come back to the industry. Mm. So, like, you personally, are you still in the city? Are you, how are you dealing with all of this? Um, so I'm actually, I, I'm not in the city. We moved across the country to Los Angeles, um, a, pl- a move that was planned um, uh, for my wife's work. And then pandemic hit and we were like, I guess we're still doing this. Uh, (laughs) So just like a historically epically bad time to drive across the country. We did. Um, Yeah. I I like, I think it's, it's twofold. One thing is that I just really threw myself into writing basically from day one. I was like, okay, we've got two weeks where we're not in rehearsal. We're going to be back in two weeks for those two weeks. I'm going to get so much writing done. Um, and so it started there. And then with each added week, I just sort of kept at it. Um, I feel I like, you know, started a collaboration with somebody that has been incredibly fruitful and has also given me a lot of purpose and drive um, and has showed me what a good collaboration, you know, on in this kind of world can be. Um, so so a lot of the, the, the san- like the sanity has come from throwing myself into the writing part of things. I, I should say, like, I'm doing a, a fair amount of performing right now. I just did, you know, Classic Stage had a had an amazing gala that was actually just came down offline. Um, and, you know, I did something for you know, the York Theater, which I think you can still watch and donate to. And, and I'm doing these amazing, like, these concerts at Town Hall. Like, I'm so excited to be doing that. I think it's going to be, like, a beautiful night of theater and, like, this sort of um, coming back into the fold and it actually like means a lot to me to be able to be a part of this concert series because I, I have been saying no to everything that has come my way for most of the year because it was too hard for me to like 
stare into the uncanny valley of Zoom performances and like yeah. try to be an actor when it wasn't like it wasn't like you know on set shooting a film or a TV show. It wasn't like in the theater with people. It it was just hard. It was really hard for me to do, and I I didn't really realize how many opportunities I was saying no to just because I couldn't get myself to do it. Um, and like, you know, I, for, for, I think it was fine. It was always, I, it was never a contentious thing. Everybody sort of always understood almost every email that came like, Hey, do you want to do this concert came with like, totally understand if you can, it's a really hard time, <laughs> you know? Uh, and for the most part, I was just saying like, sorry, I can't, it's a really hard time. Um, I just had to compartmentalize in that way. So I, I don't think I was thinking of it over the past year as me. Um, not being able to handle that element of it, but I think uh, unconsciously that is what was happening. Yeah, it was. A, it sounds like a, a a method of self protection or preservation, self preservation. I guess totally because your livelihood. I mean, as somebody, the story you told about getting onto Broadway, as somebody who wasn't sure they wanted to do it and then decided they want to do it, and then all of a sudden see this you know privilege of the great success coming out of college, and then all of a sudden, it's not like. SpongeBob ended and then you just kept auditioning and nothing happened. It's like the whole industry shut down. There was nothing. There's literally nothing for the longest time. And, and I, I was on the camp that overworked. I had to stop. Mm -hmm. I had to pull back. I was four times as busy after the pandemic when it's a full lockdown than I yeah. was without it because I wasn't, I was literally sitting here at my desk, in my house, just being like, all right, well, now what do I do? I can't go anywhere. I guess I'll just keep working. I guess I'll just keep working. And I never, I didn't take time for myself. And I, I got, I got sick for a little while. And I was like, like physically sick because I just never stopped. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think like there was, a, there was a big part of me that, that sort of did a similar thing, but different. You know, I, I was, my my writing projects were all all like self defined um, deadlines, but I was working six seven days a week, starting at eight a.m., going until whenever. Um, you know, but I, I just I like, couldn't. I think what you, you were doing, like talking to people, and I couldn't talk to people. Um, I I could stare into into my word documents and like you know let my brain fry, but I I couldn't have that like that social side of it in this in this interesting way yeah we are we are people who need people you know that's mm -hmm. what is that from spam lot right people mm -hmm. who need people <laughs> and and to not have that that emotional connection i i think my version of spirituality i think is being on stage it's walking into a room and connecting with somebody you've never talked to before it's being on stage and feeling this the the the, the feeling the attention of the mm -hmm. audience, right? Mm -hmm. So it's it's the unconscious perception of others around you and social media, Zoom, whatever the case is, all this great and wonderful technology. And we're just on the cusp of where technology is going to take us, obviously, mm -hmm. right? Um, but all of this is such a double-edged sword because it's bringing us all closer, but I feel like we're, we're drifting apart so much. And that's why... I, part of why I work so hard in this space when the pandemic hit is because I felt like art heals, art can heal, art can be better. And then not only with the pandemic was coming, is all the social reckoning and social mm -hmm. injustice and everything's happening. And I just, like the one thing that everyone can sit together, no matter if you're rich or you're poor or you're black or you're white or whatever it is, y'all sit in an audience and you can all experience a similar emotional journey that someone like yourself can take us through. Yeah. And, and we're doing that together. I think that's so right. And like, just to sort of like bump a little tangent onto that is that I just really hope as theater comes back into being this social art form that it becomes more accessible in that way because it is such an important social moment. And like moment being like literally those two hours that you're in the theater. Um, it, it is such like a huge, I, I think part of humanity to experience storytelling in that way. Um, and I think that the more kinds of stories are being told, the more perspectives of stories being told, and the more people who are able to see those stories being told in a room um, w with sort of the the energy that 
that theater in New York is able to give its art, right? Like theater in New York, the, one of the reasons that I love it so much, but also one of the problems in some ways with it is that there's there's money behind it, right? And like yeah. there is um, there's money that is m- giving resources to tell these stories better, to make them more immersive. But it also means that it's caught up in, not to get too much into capitalism, but it's like caught up in that sort of, that like sort of problematic system that makes it less accessible and that that makes it sometimes less art driven. So my I'm like really looking forward to um building back the most accessible kind of theater um in every angle. I I love that. And and I agree. I mean it is capitalism because it takes literally millions of dollars to capitalize a show to bring it to Broadway. Yeah. And like you said SpongeBob was what 7 years in development, right? So throughout the whole time how many revisions of songs and scripts and actors coming in and out and pay, paying for paying for this read and paying for that space mm-hmm. and all this stuff. I mean, SpongeBob too was put together the music by all these different artists as well. So you've got uh, that that additional headache of producing the music all you know in and of itself, which. I don't know how it all came together to sound like one cohesive show, but it did and it worked. Like Tom I Kitt, actually. Baby. Yeah, Tom Kidd. I actually I actually failed to mention earlier that I was one of those people that showed up and I was like, I got some tickets. I'm gonna show up here and I'm not gonna like it. Like I'm I'm not a kid. This yeah. is for kids. And I walked out loving it. I saw it twice. I saw it more than once. That's what I like to hear. So I, was, I was like, I gotta go back. I gotta go back and see <laughs> this again. And I brought more friends with me the second time. Oh man, see those that's it's truly like my most favorite story because I like I could feel that happening the entire way through the process. When I auditioned for it, I was like, I rolled my eyes, you know? I mean, yeah. I was I was excited because the one thing that I knew about it was Tina Landau and I was literally reading her book in class while I was, when I got the audition. <laughs> you know, I was like, I, I, the second audition that I had, because I, I had a callback and I brought a copy of the book and asked her to sign it. Oh, that's um, funny. So I have a nice signed copy of of a book that I was like, I was like, I may never meet her again. Um, and of course she became like one of my closest <laughs> collaborators and friends. Um, but yeah, I, I think that, oh God, I just, I just loved that part of SpongeBob. <laughs> I mean, like one of the first things that happened, I've never told this story before, but it just like makes me laugh. And it's, you know, it's about time. Um, <laughs> is that I like the, the way that I understood the scale of the project that I was working on was on day one of the first workshop which was just two weeks of, there was no script, there was no music yet. We were just like trying to figure out what the physicality of these characters would be. How do you do this and make it cool without being an arena show? That was the entire premise of the two weeks. And on day one, um, the stage management team who were awesome were looking around, they're like, ah, printer's broken. Uh, can you go buy a printer? And somebody <laughs> went out and just bought like a fancy printer. And I was like, oh my goodness, we're in the big leagues. They, they bought a printer. <laughs> Someone you know? bought a printer. <laughs> it was like such a, for me, that was like the, that was exactly um, the moment where I was like, oh, oh, this is Nickelodeon. Um, <laughs> and yet, and yet it was like so driven by if this isn't new and interesting and like bring something new to the table, like we're just going to scrap it, which again, a, you know, a privilege of them being okay with, with uh, spending money. That's awesome. That is so, so, so cool. Uh, so I want to get to the three standard closing questions, though, that I ask everybody to yeah. wrap up episodes. Before we get into the questions, of course, just a reminder, please go to the townhall.org, get your tickets for Broadway by the year. Ethan's going to be in the May 24th concert. There's also concerts earlier, April 26th and May 10th. I recommend them all. They start at 7 p.m. on their respective days, and they're available for streaming online for 72 hours. Now, Ethan. First question. Yes. Very simply, what motivates you? I think the thing that motivates me the most is telling stories that people can connect to. I think um, telling stories and and getting to work with people to tell their stories. I think it's just this sort of instinctual thing for me. All right. So then the next question, what advice would you give to your younger self and younger people listening now starting out down a similar path? Um, I would say that you should follow every impulse to do your weirdest things. <laughs> Just anything that feels a little bit weird or scary or like maybe like not right, go for it. 
and at the same time, study the most conventional things so you can understand why you like the weirder ones. Ooh, I like that a lot. Okay, last question is, if you could only see one show for the rest of your life, but you can see it as many times as you want, Mm -hmm. what would you see? The Town Hall concert on May 24th, baby. Um, (laughs) (laughs) um, That's, oh man, that's a really tough question. Oh, wow. If I could only see one thing for the rest of my life, but I could see it as many times as I want, Yep. And the town hall, even though you guys should all go see it, doesn't count as an answer. I think my my answer would be the original production of Company. Ah, why? I, I, I think it's because it's something that was like a really early moment for me of like seeing what musical theater could be. And I now am so grateful to musical theater that it's the only thing that's sticking in my head. Um, it's a super, it's like a super sort of not me exactly answer. And yet it's the only one I can give at the moment. Well, I think it works. Thank it's you. A, it's a unique answer. Okay. Where can we find you online? Um, I am on Instagram at Ethan Slater and my Twitter is Ethan S A Slater because my middle name is Sam. It's not Ethan's a Slater, but that is a better read of it, but that's why it's S.A. Slater. I'm just going to call you Ethan, Ethanza Slater, which is like <sighs> one of the Stark children. That is such a beautiful name. Ethanza. Thank you. <laughs> I'm taking <laughs> it with me. <laughs> and then, of course, visit thetownhall.org. You can get more of me and the theater podcast at thetheaterpodcast.com. I'm on Instagram and Twitter at theater underscore podcast. This is edited by Well-Rounded Hoodlum Productions. Thanks to Jukebox the Ghost for the intro and outro music. You, you got a surprise face. You know Jukebox? I, oh, man, I love Jukebox. Oh, they're so great. They're so great, right? Ethan, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this conversation. I've had thank a lot of fun. You. Colorful